Good afternoon. Um, I'm uh, Mabel Wilson, and I am the director of the Institute for Research in African American Studies. So I just want to welcome you all. Um, and uh, I'm also a professor in the Department of African American and uh, African Diaspora Studies here at Columbia University, or what we affectionately call AAADS. And so I just want to begin by situating the university on the unceded territory of the Lenin Lenape. And we pay respect to their diaspora and honor the past, present, and future rights and presence of the Lenin Lenape on their rightful homeland. For the past 29 years, the Institute for Research in African American Studies, founded by the late Professor Manning Marable, has been a fierce advocate for social responsibility in black studies. Dr. Marable offered a prescient reminder in the New York Times in 1998, writing that, quote, black studies must utilize history and culture as tools by which an oppressed people can transform their lives and the entire society. Scholars have an obligation to not just interpret, but to act. That works. The Institute serves as an academic resource center for a local and global community that has cultivated an intellectual tradition grounded here in Harlem and in New York City's rich history and culture. And now, in collaboration with our Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies, we continue to expand the array of contemporary scholarship and interpretation of the black experience like with today's lecture by the esteemed Dr. Valika Smelders. Introducing Dr. Smelders is my colleague, Dr. Natasha Lightfoot. Dr. Lightfoot is an associate professor in Columbia University's Department of History and a research affiliate of AAADS. Her research and teaching interests include Atlantic slavery and emancipation, black community formation and acts of resistance, and concepts and practices of freedom in the 19th century Caribbean. She is the author of the wonderful Troubling Freedom, Antigua and the Aftermath of British Emancipation of 2015, which focuses on black working people's struggles and everyday forms of liberation in British colonial Antigua after slavery's end. She was currently writing a book titled Fugitive Cosmopolitans about enslaved people's mobility, imperial subjecthood, and struggles for freedom between empires in the Caribbean. And so, Dr. Lightfoot will introduce Dr. Smelders. Uh, uh, and, and after the lecture, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. So I will turn it over to dear Natasha. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. I just uh, wanted to start everything off by introducing the esteemed Dr. Valika Schmulders, who is the head of the Department of History at the Rijksmuseum of Amsterdam. She specializes in the colonial past and its representation, museums and museum audiences, and she has published on Dutch slavery's past in the Netherlands, Curacao, Suriname, St. Martin, Ghana, and South Africa, and on Caribbean heritage in Dutch museums. She was a member of the Dutch, Colonial, Dutch Commission on Colonial Collections of the UNESCO Memory of the World Committee in the, ne in the Netherlands. She gave the sixth Rudolf van Leer lecture at the University of Leiden and received the Black Achievement Award in the category of Education and Science. Everyone, I'd like to introduce Dr. Valika Schmaldos. Hi, everybody. With a warm thank you to uh, Professors Lightfoot and uh, Wilson. It's so exciting to be here and uh, to be part of this seminar and this great conversation on uh, black history. Um, and I think my excitement has to do uh, with uh, the importance of colonial history. It is so um, crucial and relevant uh, to us, not just on this side of the uh, Atlantic Ocean, but on the other side as well. Our um, 
uh, way of looking at it in Europe is quite different, so I'll start up in a minute uh, with uh, talking more about that. Uh, we should take that away? No, 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 I think it's also being picked up on the screen. Okay. I'm here with my colleagues from the Rijksmuseum uh, in the Netherlands by invitation of the United uh, Nations Outreach Program on the Transatlantic Slave Trade and Slavery. And the program raises awareness on uh, the history of the Atlantic slave trade and its impact on the modern world and its legacies, including racism and prejudice. And every uh, year on the 25th of March, there's a commemoration the International Day of the Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. And this year, the Rijksmuseum is part of that commemoration by contributing through an exhibition. And that exhibition that was on in Amsterdam in 2021 is now traveling in a smaller version, a capsule version here to New York. It'll be opened uh, next Tuesday, next week. Um, so, um, yeah. That's uh, nice. Um, it'll be on until the 30th of March, and um, so we're here for about five, week, five weeks. And my talk today will focus on the exhibition, on how it came about, and what we see as our next steps as a museum. And I will also speak about the meaning of the exhibition, how the Netherlands are moving forward, and I will address how I see this becoming part of an international conversation that is important to have. And I want to start by providing you a little context, because as I said, it's so different the way that we look at it uh, from the other side of the Atlantic Ocean than uh, is happening here in the United States. So I want to take you to the Netherlands and what you see this on the screen, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. So it's important to keep in mind that the colonial system was a system implemented by European nations in the Americas and the Caribbean and the countries around the Indian Ocean, but I'll be talking less about that. From the 17th century on, the East and the West India companies uh, of different European countries built plantations in what they called the New World. And they took people from Africa to work on those plantations under horrific circumstances. These people were considered nothing more than instruments in a system aimed at the largest profits possible. But because the plantations were outside of Europe, Europe never saw the social history of slavery, what happened to the people that were enslaved, as its own history. So what you see here is the Rijksmuseum. It was built in 1885, and as you can see, it kind of refers to um, uh, a church. It looks like a church. And it was um, very much the place where national narrative was uh, uh, forged at the end of the 19th century. That was the end of the colonial era. It was the beginning of his new national narrative in all of Europe, and we in uh, the Netherlands were no different. So what we did here is we amassed collections that were uh, brought together by uh, wealth and power, by the Stadthouders, who later became the Dutch uh, uh, kings and queens. Um, so. All the objects that we have are very much about how power came to be from the 17th century on. So the core of our collection is very much about uh, the famous painters of the time, about Rembrandt and Frans Hals and Vermeer, who we have a big exhibition on and, uh, at the moment, which is not to be missed, of course. But it also means that the focus was very much on what happened within the constraints of national history. Um, so everything that was collected that was about the countries where we had plantations and where we took people from, that came to be part of other museums, of anthropological museums. So in the Netherlands, there's two kinds of museums. History, that is very much focused inwards, and anthropological museums, which is about how we, the Europeans, uh, went to other uh, uh, countries and uh, dominated them. So let me show you a little example of how that turns out in the Rijksmuseum. And I always like to start off a presentation by asking people, what do they see? Can I ask you? 
you see a lot of white paper. And what strikes you the most? They're all men. Pompous. They were. They were belligerent. These were the, the watches that watched over Amsterdam. So um, they're there to impress us. So does anybody see something that's off? Yeah. There's a small figure dressed in red. Yeah. Who is a figure of color. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So this um, painting is in our gallery of honor, uh, which is very much the, the, the largest, the, the most pompous paintings we have. The most important painting there is the Night Watch by Rembrandt, so that's where a lot of the tourists come to see. And this painting is right on the right hand side, so it's right uh, next to it. And um, for years and years, um, people never took notice of the boy with the red cape. They kind of never saw him. And so it says a lot about how your eye is trained, because even the curators working in the, uh, in the museum itself, they kind of looked over him. We know the names of all of these men on here, but we don't know the name of the small boy with the red cape in the middle. So it says something about how we were looking at history and how the importance, the presence of uh, people of color was there all along, but we kind of overlooked it. We kind of uh, never saw it. So that is slowly changing at the moment. So, um, The way we looked at history has been uh, changing in the Netherlands because a lot of people took history as important to them. So there were activists who, uh, for about 20, 30 years, have been saying that colonial history should be something that is part of national history. So they've been very vocal about the recognition of uh, incorporating Caribbean history as part of Dutch national history. So that activism uh, put this theme on the agenda. Also, growing academic knowledge has uh, added to what we were able to uh, speak about of colonial history. And then slowly, institutional changes came about, in part pushed along by uh, organizations like the UNESCO and in programs on slavery and the slave route. So this led to a growing public discourse, something that was avoided in the museums themselves for a long time, kind of took over on social media and people were discussing history all the time. When I started uh, out, people said to me, history is such a boring subject. But in the meantime, everybody's talking about history and about how your identity is part of that. So that has been slowly changing. But because it was taken over in the public discourse, it was always said that it was uh, something that is very divisive, that groups will not find themselves in one single narrative because all of them are looking at history from the background of their own ancestors, and that is different. And for colonial history, we saw that a lot of people in the Netherlands said, that is ancient history. It's so long ago. It's not important to us. So we should just let that go. While the Caribbean group, the group of people that was growing in the Netherlands, of people of color, they said, this is um, a history that is very much alive and relevant for us today. So we should do something about it. So the first time this happened was in 2003, when we celebrated, commemorated 140 years of uh, uh, abolition of slavery in the Netherlands. That was the first time that museums took it upon themselves to add that social history of slavery to their presentations in temporary exhibitions. And 10 years later, when we celebrated and commemorated 150 years of abolition, it happened again in 2013. But it was never done by the National Museums of the Netherlands yet. So that responsibility was taken over when we had a new director come in, that was Taco Dibbets. He announced in 2017 that the National Museum, Rijksmuseum, would be putting up an exhibition on slavery. 
And, and we uh, took it upon ourselves that, uh, yes, this exhibition or this uh, uh, history can be seen as divisive, but it is also history that can be seen as an instrument to unite, to build social cohesion. So that was our starting point. And we knew that to be able to do this, we needed to bring together a lot of people, people from inside and outside of the uh, museum. It was imperative to bring that um, multiple voices in. So to start out, we built a team of curators, you see us there in the top uh, right, with all kinds of uh, different professional and per, uh, personal backgrounds. And in this way, we could not only complement the knowledge we had together, complement each other, but also question each other all the time, which was challenging, but very uh, fruitful. We organized the think tank, the big picture you see here on the left, again with an array of specialties. And in uh, addition, we invested in conversations with many individual contacts. People who contributed to our work with academic research, varying from uh, history to anthropology, and even biological, which I'll be talking about later. And they added their genealogical research, oral history, and uh, religion as well. So it was a challenging assignment to be working on with uh, all of these people to construct an exhibition that people who saw this history as something that was long ago, to be able to put themselves in the shoes of what happened back then, the shoes of the people that lived then. So um, one of the challenging things was that the system made people who were enslaved into objects. So they were not allowed to uh, collect anything, they were not allowed to write. So we had to bring together objects and oral history, other uh, types of passing on history. And I'll be speaking more about that later. So the legacy of uh, colonial history substantiates the reason and the urgency of this exhibition. And it also explains why it was important to realize an exhibition centered on people, on human stories. Historical figures and all of their courage, resilience and greatness, but also all of their fears and egoism and failures. Because previous exhibitions had talked about people as groups and we wanted to Take one step past that. Make it uh, an exhibition about individual stories, so you can make it more complex than exhibitions that went before us. And one of the questions that we kept in our minds all the time was, what would you do, what, have, what I have done, if confronted with those circumstances? So this exhibition is about a period in which injustice was legalized. It is about those who profited from the system, those who suffered by it, and those who spoke out against it. In a sense, you could say that it is about the perpetrators and the victims, but by adding the layers of individual lives, a human being becomes so much more than just his circumstances, more than one facet of their identity. Their stories become universal. universal. So the exhibition follows 10 lives, all true stories, all historical figures. This individual approach speaks about individual roles within a larger system. What is the influence of a singular human being? What is needed to recognize injustice and to fight it? The first five stories help us understand how the system itself worked. The second five are all counter voices people with different backgrounds who throughout the 250 years that this system lasted dare to be free, independent thinkers. So the first story focuses on how people were dehumanized and taken away from their familiar surroundings and network, following Joao from Africa to Brazil. The second introduces the plantation system in Suriname through the life of Vali. The third and fourth stories bring, back to, bring us back to the Netherlands. First, we see the life of the elite in Amsterdam through opium Kopit. Then, the life of Paulus, a young man from Africa who is legally free in the Netherlands, but who was otherized by the use of a metal collar, and I'll show you the collar later on. 
The fifth story, the story of Van Bengalen, shows us how all of these characteristics that are uh, central to uh, understanding colonial slavery, how they worked around the Indian Ocean as well, under the, West in, uh, the East India Company. The second five voices uh, show us that there were always counter voices from the beginning of the system to the end. And they hail from different parts of the uh, world as well. So we start out with Surapati, who in Indonesia fought to oust the uh, East India Company. Then Sapali, a maroon woman in Suriname. She fled slavery and became the founding, woman, the founding mother of a new society. Then Tula in Curaçao, who led a rebellion against the system. Dirk van Hogendorp, who sp wrote and spoke about abolition in Indonesia, a European, a white uh, Dutch man, who spoke about abolition, but who changed his mind when at the end of his career, he started a plantation in Brazil. And then the very last person we follow is Loke. She inspired entire plantations in, in St. Martin to uh, escape. So many people fled that those plantations were completely empty 15 years before the abolition of slavery, which means that the plantation owners had no choice but to end this system in 1848. So these last five stories take us to uh, take a critical look at the process of abolition and finally the meaning of freedom. Is it the European abolitionists who were part of the system, who are so often credited by, with ending it, that brought freedom? Or are they the woman like Loke or Sapali, who inspired so many to flee that the system was unmanageable in the end that brought the system to, the, uh, to its knees? So the first thing you need when you work in a museum is objects. And that is really difficult if you speak about colonial history. Because as I uh, spoke about uh, our collection, a lot of the collection was amassed, it was uh, produced for people who were wealthy. It wasn't produced by the people who were enslaved themselves. So how do you use these objects to be able to speak about this? So we have, for example, the golden box that you see on the right uh, top. Um, which speaks, which was a gift for one of the first stadtholders, who was also one of the main persons in the West India Company. And it speaks about the wealth that was being brought in from Africa and from around the globe. Curacao is mentioned, for example. But if you take a better look, it also shows that one of the many uh, forms of trade was the trade in human beings. So. That's one way that we can talk about it. But you also need to be able to talk about the people who were enslaved themselves. So we had to bring in new objects, like the footstock you see on the top over there, which is also the main object that you will be able to see here in New York, um, to show that this system was built on repression, on um, violence, and that it was not just all glitter and gold like the box seems to show you. And it was very uh, important to us that we speak about our own collection. So Opian, who I talked about uh, earlier, who uh, was a wealthy woman, lived on the, um, uh, in Amsterdam. Normally we only speak about the wealth, about how Rembrandt portrayed her. But now for this exhibition it was really important to also speak about where the money came from that made her able to live in such a way. And we talked about her two husbands and one of those husbands lived in Brazil and um, uh, raped a young enslaved woman there, um, uh, created a child there with her. So. It enables us to ask questions about what would she have known about all of this history? Would she have been aware of what, uh, where the money came from and how she was connected to slavery as well? And of course we brought in uh, objects like the sugar kettle on the right hand side over there, which is something you see all over Suriname, but was never brought into the National Museum of the Netherlands before. And the collar I just spoke about, this is something that was never portrayed as being part of uh, slavery history in the Netherlands. 
a lot of museums have those types of colors and they were always categorized as dark colors. But if you get, take a better look at um, art of that period, at uh, paintings in which you see the wealthy and their uh, servants, then you can see, like you see on the bust over there, that um, black servants were made to wear colors. So it makes much more sense to see that color in the context of colonial history than to think it was worn by a pet. And of course, we wanted to show the other side of the history as well. So we brought in, uh, we discovered that we actually have this uh, small uh, drawing by um, a French uh, 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 artist, which is Toussaint Louverture. There were no Dutch African heroes depicted at the time at all, but it happened in uh, the French realm. So we use this to speak about our own Dutch uh, African heroes in the Caribbean, and um, well, that was an important way of balancing out that you don't just talk about people as victims, but also as the new leaders of uh, the Caribbean. One last thing that we could not talk about with all historical objects, we try to use historical objects in, throughout the museum always, but we needed to bring in modern art as well, which you see here at the top, which is an um, installation made by uh, Romuald Hazoumé, a West African artist, and he built this ship to be able to show or take the visitor to that uh, experience of having been uh, taken from Africa to the Americas and what it must have felt like. One of the more controversial decisions we needed to make as a museum was the use of interdisciplinary research. So we did not bring in just historians, but also people with all different backgrounds. And the people you see here is uh, Susie Moses, who will be here in New York speaking the 30th of March, so uh, please come and listen to her. She is a descendant of uh, the Maroons in Suriname, and the Maroons have their oral tradition in which they speak about the women who smuggled rice from Africa to the Americas and in the Americas from the plantations towards their freedom. So that smuggling of rice uh, enabled people to, re to uh, build new societies on their own. So they don't see themselves as descendants of enslaved, they see themselves as descendants of, re of free people. But we could never prove that that oral history was really true. So we brought in um, uh, this lady, Tinde van Andel, professor of biology, and she was able to prove through DNA research that that particular type of rice only exists in Africa, West Africa, and in, uh, near the maroon villages of uh, uh, the people that I talked about. So finally, we could see, we could say that that oral history was really true because it was always seen as something that could not be proven. And that enabled us, what you see here, is we went into our depots with uh, uh, Susie and Tinde, and we looked for ways to connect that to our own uh, collection. So we found uh, maps on which you see people fleeing, you see females fleeing with uh, bags in their hands, uh, so you see them taking the rice with us. So that opened up for us a way of connecting people to our own collection in ways that we didn't know were possible before. So I have to point out the exquisite design as well, made by Afaina de Jong. Um, because our museum, as I showed it to you, was so much built on bringing across one type of story, the narrative of the wealth and the power that the Netherlands amassed, it was very difficult, it was not a blank canvas, it was very difficult to put up a exhibition on um, uh, oppression in there. 
So what she did is she brought in these bright colors, which I would never have thought of myself, and which worked wonderfully. Every gallery had a different color, and she worked with mirrors, which you will also see in uh, New York, here in New York, at the United Nations, because those mirrors kind of uh, allowed us to, without words, make people think about themselves as part of this history, as part of society, how um, uh, you reflect on that. And as you can see, it was also, they were done in strips. So you kind of get to see parts of the exhibition, and, uh, but you don't see everything all at once. So it's also about what do you see and what don't we, what do we uh, know? So we wanted to connect these historical figures to the here and now as well, to society at the moment. And at that time, when we were working on the exhibition, it was a, a focus of debate whether you could prove that colonial history had a legacy. And um, um, so we needed to find a form of uh, transmitting that. And we sought a, a descendant uh, connected to each of the 10 historical figures to be able to address that. So these uh, storytellers could uh, talk about their ancestors, about how that history affects their lives and how they look back on it. And that was really important to us. And let me just point out a few for you. Like the lady in the center on the top, Joy de Lima, she's a well-known actress in the Netherlands. Her last name, de Lima, refers to Fort Elmina, the Dutch fort uh, on the West African coast from where people were brought from Africa to the plantations in um, the Caribbean. Um, one of my favorites is Annemieke van der Vecht, the lady almost in the middle there on the bottom. She's a descendant of one of those young men you see on so many paintings in our museum and in other museums. She had no idea, um, but when she went on a search for her ancestors, she discovered that one of her ancestors was an African man who lived in the Netherlands and um, well, he had a family there, had children. So a lot of people in the Netherlands are descendants from him and they have no clue that they have a black ancestor. And since then she has taken it upon herself to speak about it and to raise awareness about that. On her left-hand side, that's Arte Kibbelaar, whose family hails from a Curaçaoan plantation, the plantation from which Tula uh, initiated, initiated his uh, rebellion. And he laced his story with recordings we had from uh, the 20th century uh, of a lady who was actually born in 1853 born in slavery, and that lady, Machichi, she speaks about what her grandmother taught her. And she says, my grandmother taught me that I'm no less than the children of the uh, plantation owners. So in their minds, the people who were enslaved, uh, they never considered themselves slaves. That's, those are her words. So we knew that this exhibition was uh, a subject, um, was about a subject that had been underrepresented in museums, and it's uh, something that uh, led to a fierce public debate. We knew that our visitors would be touched by this exhibition, that it would lead to all kinds of emotions. And we aimed to bring in more descendants from enslaved people that visited, that not visited the museum before, because of the audience that normally came to the museum was very much upper class, uh, white, uh, highly educated, and we wanted to bring in a mixed group of people. But at the same time, those people who had never been to the uh, museum before, we did not want them to feel like just visitors. We wanted to involve them with what was going on. So we did that by making a, a space, uh, and we, bought, uh, we put up 10 pedestals, and we brought in these two amazing artists from Curaçao, David Bade and Tirso Marta, and they worked with every visitor that came in 
to rebuild the, on those 10 pedestals the 10 historical figures, to add their stories to the, uh, those new figures. So that allowed us to uh, rethink at a moment where a lot of statues in the public spaces in different countries were toppled, to rethink who should be on those pedestals, who are the, the heroes of uh, the here and now. And last but not least, um, trying to bring in more people, trying to be as transparent as we possibly could as a museum, we let a filmmaker, Ida Dus, follow the curators in our search for objects, in our uh, conversations together, in our search for how to build this uh, exhibition. And that was kind of difficult because, uh, well, it was challenging and we were struggling with how to deal with that. So to have cameras present was kind of, uh, um, yeah. We, we felt uh, intimidated by the cameras at, uh, at uh, certain times, but at the end we were so happy that we did that because the result is that you see us in all our vulnerability, in all our doubts, in all our insecurities, rethinking everything. And um, when the uh, exhibition was finally opened, COVID was still in full force. So nobody could visit the museum. So the film about the exhibition was on national television even before the exhibition opened. And people saw us struggling with uh, what to do. And so many people came up to us afterwards and said to us that it was so good to see that you don't need to have all the answers, that it, it's okay to just be searching. And um, well, that really uh, brought in, I think, in a discussion, a discourse that was really heated, it brought a bit of uh, relaxation as well, a bit of acceptance. So at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned how our collection was built on what was assembled by the elite and those in power. For a long time, the assumption was that those collections of the powerful and rich were not related to slavery at all. Our research showed the contrary. The objects are full of references to the economy of slavery, links between institutions and slavery, of personal profit from slavery, and to the way Africa and Africans were portrayed in the colonial period. And to point that out, we had extra texts put in in our permanent display, which at the moment have been incorporated into new permanent texts. And that really was quite a learning process. It has changed our view on the museum, on our permanent collection, on our permanent exhibition, because for now, uh, it is, uh, for, for us, it is clear that power and wealth built from the 17th century on cannot be seen separate from the colonial system. So while it's kind of not here, it is here all along. So we need to be able to address that in new texts, and that's what, uh, what we're working on. And at the same time, it brought up so many new questions as well. Because now that we realize that the Netherlands was not a black box or a, a white box, a white space from the 17th century on, we need to find out more about that black experience in the Netherlands. So that color already helped us get a little closer to what it must have felt like to be black in the 17th century in the Netherlands. But at the same time, we have so many more questions. Who wore those colors? Why? At what times? Um, we see them on the necks of people who were serving in households. We see them on the necks of people who were part of the military as well. So we just want to know more about uh, what place it really had in uh, Dutch society at that time. And then there's uh, objects like the cabinet you see here on the left that speak about this, the way that people were stereotyped. Uh, the way they were depicted. And these are uh, uh, 
incomprehensible uh, to us at the moment as well. Because what you see here, this cabinet, the pictures on it, those are all biblical references. And then you see that um, the cabinet rests on four figures, African figures, two male, two female. They are wearing turbans. They are wearing like what looks like a Roman uh, um, harness. So there's references to Rome, ancient Rome, to uh, the Middle East, and then at the same time to the plantation economy, because they are wearing skirts of tobacco leaves, and they are wearing um, on their backs uh, uh, what's uh, seen as an allegory of the Americas. So it is so intricate. There's so many, much going on all at once that we want to know more about what this really meant. So there's lots of work to be done still. Then we are trying to bring in new objects as well, objects that we had not seen before. And this is a perfect example of that. This painting was sold recently and we were happy to uh, be able to buy it as a busy market in the early 19th century. And at first glance, if you don't look right, this is, um, this is it, what you see if you zoom in. So it's much smaller um, and from farther uh, back. So then you just see people on a market. But if you look closely, you can see two types of depiction of uh, uh, the black presence in the Netherlands. You see there on that balcony, you see a man who looks like maybe he would have been a servant. Um, but it's clear that he's being... Um, uh, shown as an object. He's part of what's happening on that market. And then on the left-hand side, you see black people in a depiction, an allegorical depiction of uh, referring to the Americas, the plantation system. So it's very much about uh, the economic side of uh, the colonial uh, story. And at the same time, it might be something that is an early depiction of what later on would become to be exhibitions and uh, uh, colonial exhibitions and human zoos as well. So fascinating and uh, still a lot of work uh, to be done. But we clearly don't want to just talk about the black presence there as people who were victims. So we're so happy to have this uh, painting as well, which was bought about 10 years ago. Uh, and we believe this is a depiction of Christophe Lemoor, a man who was part of uh, the... Um, he worked as an, an archer for Charles V. Um, and that shows us that a hundred years before the West India Company uh, was founded, there was already a black presence in what was then the Netherlands. And um, so that was a long time before slavery was introduced into the Dutch system. Of course, it already existed in other parts of Europe, but not yet in the Netherlands. So what you see here is a man that was part of society. He was free, he was working, uh, um, and probably well paid, if you look at the way he, uh, he is dressed. And also on his hat, you see this small emblem, which says that he was a, a devout Christian as well. So that enables us to speak about this black presence as not just something that came about since the colonial era, and that's not just one way of looking at uh, discrimination and the way that uh, uh, people um, uh, dealt with each other in, uh, in this society. So at the start I spoke about how the Netherlands have been slowly growing in its acceptance of the fact that slavery and colonial uh, history are very much part of our national history. And it's not something that happened uh, far away and does not concern Dutch people. It is a system that was implemented by Dutch companies with state support and later on implemented by the Dutch state itself. So this led the Dutch Prime Minister to decide to apologize, and this happened two months ago on behalf of the Dutch government. And um, part of his speech I have on the screen here, and I think it is 
worth noting, uh, because I'm speaking about the uh, uh, personal stories in our exhibition as a key element of people being able to put themselves in the shoes of other people. It is worth knowing that he uh, spoke about how it came about that he changed his mind. And uh, for a long past, this prime minister, for a long time, he said that the slavery past was something that he could simply not change and that said, therefore should be left in the past. Now, the prime minister of the Netherlands is a historian, but everything that he had read in books about the broad strokes of history that had never led him to see history from uh, the point of view of the people who were enslaved. And his mind was changed when he heard a personal story. It changed because a new colleague of his, Sylvana Simons, during a public debate, a debate in the Dutch parliament, she told him, this is not a past that is long forgotten. My mother's grandmother was born in slavery. It was her reality and it was my family's reality. So that brings me back to our exhibition and our key element, the personal stories, uh, as a means to making the past about individuals, about our ancestors, about you and me. And we of the Rijksmuseum, we are thrilled that the 10 stories of historical figures we worked on are here in, the, uh, in New York at the moment. And afterwards, they will be made available through the UN uh, because the exhibition will be translated into a poster version which will be available for all UN offices worldwide. So the exhibition will be traveling uh, onwards as well. And since the beginning, since we started working on this exhibition, at the back of our minds was, how can we choose 10 stories from the millions of stories that are out there? So we knew that what we would start was just the beginning and that it needs to be taken and uh, it needs to be part of an ongoing conversation. So these stories and many others have helped people connect on a national level in the Netherlands and now thanks to the platform that the UN is providing, this work will be taken to an international level as well. And what we hope is that each new location will add their own stories, their own objects, their own oral history. And here in the US, we are doing that by uh, 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 putting on a program next month at the end of the exhibition. Um, and we'll bring in museum directors from Europe, from the US, and from the Caribbean. And they will speak about what new narratives are needed in uh, museums worldwide. And we hope to see you there, of course. And we hope to continue this dialogue about our common future. So I've put on here, the exhibition is on for the 27th to the 30th. We'll have a screening of the uh, movie on the 29th probably, but bear with us, we still need to find a venue for that. And the program of the 30th will be at the United Nations headquarters. So thank you, and I'm uh, curious to hear about your thoughts and uh, questions. Hi, everyone. Um, before we open it up to the general audience for Q&A, um, I, again, am Natasha Lightfoot, a professor of history and a research fellow in African American and African diaspora studies here. And I'll be having a conversation with Dr. Schmulders about um, some of the really important points that you raised in your discussion today. Um, interestingly, you ended with one of the points that I planned to get to about the apology of the Dutch PM, but we'll get to that. I kind of wanted to start to ju with just sort of asking you a question about the general state of knowledge that existed in the Dutch public space, in di public discourse, maybe in even educational, um, you know, sort of K through 12, maybe even, you know, where exactly do you feel like the state of knowledge was prior to the exhibit? about the Dutch colonial and in particular the Dutch slave past? Well, that's a nice question to be mm -hmm. asked here in the United States because <laughs> <laughs> I think for a long time in uh, the Dutch schooling system, mm -hmm. um, slavery was hardly discussed. 
and whenever it was discussed it was just maybe part of a page maybe one two pages mm -hmm. and it was mostly about what happened here in the united states oh. yeah i have no idea if that's surprising here but yeah okay. it happened a lot in the, in the netherlands I think there was this uh, discomfort with our own history, mm -hmm. um, so there was not much of a focus on that. And uh, what we did discuss was uh, what happened here, so the plantation system and how that later on translated into um, a segregation system. Right. And the right. Dutch really prided themselves on never having had uh, segregation laws. Mm. So. Um, to go back to your question, what was the state of uh, knowledge? It was very, it was quite poor. Yeah. And there was very little to be uh, learned in schools and then uh, museums kind of avoided it for a long time as well. And then the general public kind of took over. They were discussing it because these activists started engaging people in this conversation about this needs to be recognized, it mm. needs to be part of what we're talking about. And was that shift very recent when activists started to really gain more of a voice and get this conversation to have more traction? I think there's been activists from the 60s on, mm, okay. but I think they really gained traction from the beginning of this century on when uh, the Netherlands implemented uh, a slavery monument in 2002 uh, okay. and a slavery institute that mm -hmm. needed to address the, the Dutch slavery. Um, so that really helped. Um, but at the same time, the slavery institute was uh, deactivated 10 years later as well. And I mm -hmm. guess that that's when it happened, that people said this needs to be done. So it needed to be done in right. so the that, regular the, museums. Right, so the end of that institute sort of became a moment of reckoning to say, well, where will this education go? Yeah. What will we have left if we don't yeah. have that? Yeah. And that's yeah. how this kind of sea change began. Yeah, and the fact that mm -hmm. the, all that activism took place in the public space, on social media, it reaches mm -hmm. everybody, everybody. Mm -hmm. Whenever something comes out, everybody is engaged. So that really speeds things up. Right. And so then how would you place this exhibit in the conversation? Would you say that this exhibit has been a part of that shifting of the public consciousness even further? Um, and sort of in what ways was this most evident? I think most of the exhibits that were before were about the general um, broad lines of history mm -hmm. and they were in small